the last four months. We've had Bill Ackman, Elon Musk, multiple CNBC everyday presenters. That one had about 60,000 people in it. Being in physics class at 9.30 to sit in the back of physics class live trading. All of a sudden, I was probably trading for about two hours a day. And then any breaks or recess that we had, I was not going to the gym anymore. I was going to my professor's office to talk about spot trading gold. It was a combination of that plus the rewarding feeling of actually winning. I ended up returning about 25% in six months. I was impressed right off the bat when I started to join these spaces and I started to kind of wrap my head around how you monetize it and you're monetizing it. You're giving small startups or even big companies the opportunity to pitch themselves to tons of followers and you yourself are gaining followers at that moment, adding more people to your newsletter. I mean, it's a dream business for people when you think just from that perspective. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Today for episode two, we have Wolf Financial. Wolf Financial runs a financial newsletter, analyst turned CEO, running over 40 hours, I believe, of Twitter spaces a week. Some might say a pioneer for that because you've been kind of going since those Twitter spaces started. Really excited to have you on the show and kind of talk about that journey. Thank you, God, for being here. And what's up? How you doing? Living the dream, man. Appreciate you having me on and definitely doing a lot of stuff in the world of Twitter spaces and finance media. Yeah. And just for the viewers, Gav and I kind of stumbled upon each other. Um, I saw that he was hosting these Twitter spaces. I was kind of working on my brand on Twitter, trying to get a little more out there. Um, and he gave me the chance. And, and now I've been able to speak on some amazing speakers panels with some of the smartest people ever. And I think People really need to to give that credit to Twitter Spaces because sometimes, I mean, you can learn such amazing things just by being on there. And I really appreciate you doing it as a kind of a free resource to the public and allowing people to kind of go on there and learn. But I'd kind of like to start at the beginning of the journey. I saw that you said you were an analyst at Goldman Sachs. I'd love to kind of hear about that experience and where your journey started. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I would say that that was a pretty good spot for the start of my investing journey. Um, I'd worked in accounting for a little bit before that, but it wasn't something for me. I worked at Goldman in Philly, which was a private wealth management office. So when people hear Goldman, they think often investment banking and they think trading, but that's not really what I was doing. I was more working with high net worth clients okay. and helping them on a day-to-day -day basis, really just answering questions, concerns about the market, rebalancing portfolios for them if they wanted to be slightly more aggressive, conservative, and ultimately, as any analyst does, really supporting my team and supporting the private wealth manager that I was working for. We had about five billion, five and a half billion AUM between really five billion with one team and then another half billion with two other teams that I supported on the side. And there I really learned everything from how to, you know, really construct a portfolio to how to talk to high net worth people. I always say that the most valuable thing I got from there was that my boss, whenever he was on a phone call, I was given the ability to actually just put my headset on, tap into his call because I had everyone's lines on my phone and just mute out. And I could just listen. And that's what I did all day. I just listened to people that had far more industry experience and advice than I did and just take, take it all in. I wrote down, honestly, like two to three notebooks full of notes, just handwritten notes during my time there. And I also just networked my way around with everybody. And so that was a great opportunity. And ultimately, I ended up progressing from private wealth management to an offer that I got for a private equity firm called Versa Capital Management, actually repping right now. Shout out. Nice. Versa. Um, yeah, Versa was really cool. Total change of scenery. I went from being on this open style floor at Goldman, where it was just always phones ringing, always people talking to this private equity field where everybody has their own office and there's just never any like noise or anything <laughs> like that. And um, it was cool, though. I got to work really closely with a couple of companies. I got to, uh, you know, go and actually fly down to where these companies were located, work out at their CFO's offices, have conversations with them about what their company needed to succeed, and then ultimately ended up moving into the startup space with the advent of COVID. And that led us to where we are here. Very cool, man. That's, that's, that's an amazing journey. What, was that something that you always wanted? I know you said you started with accounting. Were you, were you always passionate about finances and investing even before it was a career? Yeah, I got passionate about finance for two reasons. My first real introduction to the stock market was in 11th grade macroeconomics class where the professor put everybody on one of those market watch. Yep you know, play games and everybody gets a hundred K and, you know, a lot of people just don't have any interest in it. Right. It's not their thing. But for me, I was just hooked all of a sudden. And it went from, you know, being in physics class at nine 30 to sit in the back of physics class, live trading. 
because it was 930. And all of a sudden, I was probably trading for about two hours a day. And then any breaks or recess that we had, I was not going to the gym anymore. I was going to my professor's office to talk about spot trading gold and doing all different types of stuff like that, right? And I think it was a combination of that plus the rewarding feeling of actually winning. I ended up returning about 25% in six months. Uh, really, you know, beat out the class super well in that. And obviously this was during the bull run. (laughs) Um, You know, this is post 2008, at least a few years afterwards. And that's what got me, you know, that really interesting feeling of like, oh, this is possible and this is super interesting and I can deep dive deep into these companies and have an understanding of it. The second thing that I think just put me in the finance realm was coming from a place where I was growing up and my father was uh, making a lot of really, uh, really great money as a doctor and living a certain type of lifestyle. And then he got heavy into real estate in 2007. And, you know, I can't blame him necessarily. I know a lot of people got into real estate in that area. The problem is uh, really went all in, you know, with everything that we had. And in 2008 had to declare bankruptcy and got foreclosed upon for a majority of the properties that uh, he owned. And my whole life, you know, changed. I was only 10 years old at the time, but I really actually was able to feel that change. And I just remember thinking, you know, where did all that money go, right? Like, how did this all happen? Why did it, why were we eating here and now we're eating here? And that put in my mind that firm thing, which to be honest, is actually on the opening page of our booklets that we would give our clients at Goldman, which said, to quote, it said, it's not about how much money you make, it's how much you keep. And that was just really something that stuck with me. And I started thinking about that. And that's what led me down the path of finance because I was like, I don't want other people who are in really good financial positions to have to go through what I did and how can I help them and help myself. That's very cool. Um, it's often when I, when I meet with people and talk with people and, and you find out kind of where that deep rooted passions come from, it's amazing to see how that drive and determination can really turn things into reality. So that, that's amazing that you went from there all the way through that amazing career. Um, with that, we transition over to Wolf Financial, your jump from being, like you said, an analyst to now the CEO of your own company. So let, let, let's start with the where Wolf came from, what that name kind of is from, and then what kind of the early stages of that company look like. Yeah, Wolf has had multiple stages. It stands for the world of learning finance, which I think Very is cool. pretty applicable, but it also stands for being a pack animal, right? It's a wolf. They have this notion that there's lone wolves, but really wolves are actually one of the most pack traveling animals of all. Um, They love being together. They work together uh, simultaneously. And I really thought that that was applicable for investors who should be working together and do in my spaces. There's been multiple stages to wolf when I've told this story before, but when I first came on, uh, when I was first reached out to wolf was the idea of a couple of friends of mine who had hired a couple finance guys and a couple tech people. And the idea was just how do we make investment research easier for our generation, right? We don't have anything right now that is just a simple app. I go, I plug in the ticker, and it just tells me, right, based on fundamental and technical analysis, what's happening in an easy to understand format. Like that just, we felt like it didn't exist. And it certainly wasn't free for people. And we wanted something along those lines. And that evolved into an idea of what about a social component, right? And bringing in people. So ultimately, in the early days, the idea behind Wolf was building out a social finance app similar to Public or Stock Twits, like you've seen probably with yep. a couple of additional pieces of our own. And as we built that out, I was running operations. And ultimately, I ended up in a marketing role where I was tasked with building a profile for us and other social media so that we could make relations with you know really great people with great audiences and then onboard them to our app. And during that time, I chose Twitter and I started religiously posting on Twitter, engaging on Twitter. And then about five, six months into that journey, Twitter spaces got dropped. Like you said, I was one of the first people to find them. I got beta access. Twitter ended up hiring me as an independent contractor to help them build out and to host Twitter spaces in the early days. So I really got into the thick of things. And it was great because I was building this audience for our app. But then about six months into that, there was a large pivot that happened. Essentially, we were raising capital for the company. And the investors, uh, I think, made some really smart calls, which was, this is a super crowded area, right? The social finance area, you have to differentiate yourself somehow, how are you going to differentiate yourself? And so the team began working on a product, which was essentially a stock insurance product, which I won't go too far into here. But it was a great idea. It was patentable. It was something that could really be put in a lot of brokerages. And our idea was, let's put this in our brokerage in our app, and everyone have to come here. And the investors were saying, basically, no, the way that you scale this is, 
you make an API and then you sell that API to these businesses and then you get recurring revenue plus a one time up upfront fee, right? There's all these pieces to it. And the original co-founders of the firm were like, that makes a lot of sense, right? This is a great path to go down. And so we actually ended up splitting into two firms. They rebranded, took the tech and the back end and are now a site called, uh, it's called withbelay.com, I'm pretty sure. I'll just double check that real quick for you. But yeah, withbelay.com is what that's called. And then I actually purchased the entire brand, all those brand assets, the social media, and I spun Wolf Financial out as a social media marketing firm heavily based on Twitter spaces. So although I did initially come in as a COO and worked at night as a tech company, we ended up pivoting and turning into two companies, which are both doing really well now. Obviously, I'm pretty happy with what's going on on my end. They've recently raised another round. Uh, they have a great team. We're in contact. So hopefully I'll be bringing that product to the public sooner than later as well. Very cool. Um, what, what made you pick Twitter um, with all the different social media platforms? What kind of made you lean in? And then with that, we've had this very dramatic change in ownership at Twitter and all of these kind of headlines. How was that also building on Twitter and having to go through those kind of headwinds? Well, I'll give credit to my freshman year college roommate who got me onto Twitter. Uh, he did not do it on purpose, though. Uh, <laughs> the way that it happened was my freshman year college roommate was extremely addicted to Twitter. Loved it, was always on it, always, you know, tweeting and stuff like that. And I thought it'd be hilarious if I made a Twitter account, turned on notifications, and every time he posted, I dropped a troll post comment <laughs> underneath it. And so that was, it was just part of our relationship. And I, I thought it was the funniest thing. He probably hated it, probably wanted to block me, but didn't <laughs> want to create bad blood. So I was just getting onto Twitter just to annoy this guy. And then slowly I started getting into the sports world with Twitter. And I started saying, oh, this is a great place for me to get updates on news, sports, things like that. And then during COVID, all of a sudden, there's a couple of finance posts that start creeping into my feed. And I'll give Gan, uh, credit actually to Gannon Breslin, um, who you can, uh, or Gannon, is it Breslin? Yeah, it's got to be Gannon Breslin, um, who's really great on Twitter. Um, he runs a newsletter called The Drop. And Gannon was kind of like posting both about sports and about finance. And so he was showing up in my feed with both these type of posts. I was like, oh, what's this? And so I ended up creating a new account, which became the Wolf account. And on that account, I followed him, Ramp Capital, and Morning Brew. And like those are like my first three. And then it just kind of sprung from there. For me, the reason I liked it was because I felt like you could do Twitter from anywhere. When it came to TikTok, I felt like I had to put like actual time into like, all right, I have to carve out an hour of my day to record. Then I have to edit it. And everybody's a professional editor. And with Twitter, it was just like easy to post and easy to get updates out there. And everybody was talking. And then Spaces really became the game changer. That's awesome. Um, and I know you have a newsletter now. I know newsletters have become extremely popular. One, how has that journey gone? And two, what are maybe some of the favorite newsletters that you like to read and, and get information from? Yeah, newsletter is doing great. Uh, it's really been heating up lately, which is awesome to see more and more interest coming for the newsletter. So this was the first month that I got over a thousand subs to my newsletter and the month is not over yet. We're 26 days in. Awesome. So it's currently sitting at almost 7,000 subs. Um, started the month with uh, 30 days ago, it had 5,750. So it was up 20% last 30 days, uh, which is really nice to see. Open rate has increased. Average click-through rate is up 41.7%. So I'm really liking the numbers on the newsletter. Um, I try to keep my newsletter in line with what I'm doing. So it's very Twitter-focused and investing-focused. So I put out three newsletters a week, Monday, it's Monday morning, you get a list of all my spaces for the week. So hey, here's the spaces schedule, you don't have to go check on Twitter, you're just going to get it delivered to your inbox. Here's links for them if you want to set reminders. So it just makes it very easy for my audience to know when my spaces are. Number two, I would say is on Wednesday. Uh, typically, it's a Twitter thread that did really well that then gets turned into newsletter format, or it's just an investing lesson overall. So we'll talk about things like here's Warren Buffett's top 10 holdings, here's how to conduct fundamental analysis, here's the 10 technical analysis patterns you need to know. Here's, uh, you know, why you should care about macro catalysts, right? Like stuff like that, which is just very investing focused, but also pulls from my Twitter. And then every Friday, I started this newsletter called uh, The Weekly Howl. And I was basically under the impression of nobody is on Twitter more than me, especially at that time. Um, there was a time when I was on a call with Twitter. And this was in, gosh, I want to say like, December of 2021. And they told me that I was in like the top like 50 users in the world at the time wow. of just the amount of time that I was spending on Twitter. 
because I was literally on Twitter at least 70, 80 plus hours a week um, at the time. And so just really crazy stuff. So I started this newsletter, which was, here's the best 10 tweets that I've seen from finance Twitter this week. It's three that are um, very informational, three that are funny, and then four that are just all around great. And so those are my three newsletters. They're super easy to read. Like my Monday one is like a two minute scan. My Friday one is like a four minute scan. And my Wednesday one is probably like five to six minutes. So I keep them very easy for people. I don't want to be stuffing up anyone's inbox or anything like that. You know, it's simple stuff. So I, I like it. And obviously it's being received well. And I get some great feedback on that. Um, in regards to newsletters that I'm looking at. All right. So I don't read a ton of newsletters because I'm on Twitter so much, to be honest, <laughs> that I just like get all my content from there. So like, you know, I'm subscribed to stock market news. Like I, I just get notifications from him. So to be honest, like anything that's breaking news, I already have. I do read uh, pretty religiously newsletters, I would say from JK Molina. JK Molina is all about how to grow and how to sell on Twitter. So it's not finance focused at all. It is just how to monetize your audience, how to engage with your audience, how to create better content, all different stuff like that, that really speaks to me. I'm also subscribed to a newsletter from Ben Muir. Uh, and Ben Muir is all about um, systems is really his thing. It's just making your life more efficient, um, really just ways that you can like, it's like secret, you know, websites you've never heard of, browser add-ons you've never heard of, all different types of pieces like that. And then of course I get like Morning Brew, you know, some of those classics, right? That keep me in the world of finance. Um, I think I've got like the li liquidity one, um, some of those other ones. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of the popular ones there. Very cool. Um, something cool that I want to touch on is... You have this big finance background. All of your spaces are hosted around finance, but you really did build an amazing social media brand. Like you created amazing content. What was that journey like? I think you're at like 152,000 followers now on Twitter. Talk a little bit about that because just 157. And, and 157. That is amazing. I, I think I was on spaces when you broke 150 with you with you as a speaker when you got right over that mark. So that was really cool. But 157, that, that's amazing. And selfishly for me, I've, I've had a few brands, I've started a few companies in my life. And the hardest part is the social media, keeping up with it, building that consistent audience. So I'd love to let kind of the listeners get a little bit of insight on what that journey looked like building that amazing following. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, because I was put in a real position to succeed. Because it's very hard for some people to start out on social media for multiple reasons. One, they're doing it all alone, right? Yep. And they just need help, right? They need help with graphics, with posting, with motivation, stuff like that. Number two, they don't see the reason why they're doing it, right? They're just doing it for themselves and they're hoping it's going to get to a point where it creates opportunity and money, but they're not there yet. I was in a very different position because when I started the Wolf account, I was starting it for this company that I was working at, right? It wasn't yep. for me necessarily. And because of that, I was given a lot of support. I had a whole graphic design team that was anytime I needed a graphic. Hey, Rob, can you, you know, go ahead and create this for me? Oh yeah, no problem. Right. I had uh, other marketing people on my team like, oh, I can't post today. Like, can you get this up? You know, who's got some good ideas for tools? So I had that. And I also, um, to be honest, I worked 17 months unpaid in the beginning of it. Wow. Um, but I knew that I was building for equity, right? Yeah. I had equity in the company. So I had things that I was working on. And then eventually, really towards the latter stages, like the last two months before we ended up flipping the company, I was getting a paycheck for like a month or two. Um, so I guess that there was that. Um, so I think I was just in a better position to succeed. Now, number two, you know, I, I came in at the right time. I wish I'd come in six, seven months earlier. It would have been even better. But I came in in September of 2020. Market's hot. It's ripping. Everybody's talking. Things aren't going to peak for another four months, right? So it's like, even in my early stages, there's so much activity. Like I would tweet at these large accounts and just like, I would just add them with their favorite ticker. I'd be like, hey, what do you think about this ticker today? Or what do you think about this news? And like, they'd actually respond, even though I had like hundred followers because everybody was just so hot on Twitter at the time. Yep. So I hit like a really good timing. Um, and then number three, I think for me was just that launch of spaces. So I only had like four or 500 followers in, by the time spaces came out, that was like six months. And then spaces came out and like 10 days later, I had 2000 followers. Right. And so, and then it was just like every seven days I was getting a thousand followers in the beginning. I wish I'd known more people wanted everyday content. I thought if I held, you know, three spaces a week, that would like be max. Now I do 28, you know? Yeah. And uh, back then I was getting at least a hundred followers an hour when I was doing them. 
Um, I think in the early days of social media, it's just super helpful, like to find a course from someone who's already done it and just read through that. Like JK Molina has them, Ben Mir probably has them. Uh, there's another guy, Matt Gray. He's got great ones. Like there's a formula for how to game and how to be successful on social media. Go out, spend the 200 bucks, get a course, learn it, understand it and get, get from there. Right. Like, uh, these guys that I'm friends with Clint, Steve and Curtis all did a growth cohort. And even though I had 150,000 followers, I still hopped in it um, because I thought that they had more to share. And I learned more. Um, They shared all their favorite tools. There's so many tools people don't understand. Like, like Twitter is not about being, it's, it, it being original is not enough to go viral, right? It's, saying something in a unique way that's been proven to work, right? Like things like that. And so there's tools like Tweet Hunter and Tweemax and Taplio and just all these places that you can get ideas and content. And ChatGPT now, right? Like there's all these different spots. So I think just, you know, not going into it blind. Like my first day of really tweeting on Twitter was I live tweeted the GameStop hearing. And I just did like a ton of tweets, but like my formatting was not good. Like I was just throwing out random stuff. I was putting up every quote I could hear. There was just like so much more that could be done. So yeah, I was in a good spot when I started it. Thank God. If you're not in that condition, you don't have a team, go ahead, do the research, get some tools, things like that. There's probably plenty of free ones too um, that you can learn about. Just make sure that you're putting your effort in the right places, basically. Yeah, for sure. I might need to pick your brain a little bit off camera on some of these tools because Twitter's new for me and, and I've been working on building my brand there and I found a lot of these tools and it's it's crazy because it feels like it's never ending. I just continue to see kind of more and more. So that's very cool. And do you work with a team now or is it just you? Um, because I know you had that team behind you originally. Yeah, yeah. So I went for a long time there without a team. Recently, I've been hiring, been growing um, now. So I have some people that help me with uh, cold outreach to get, you know, speakers on spaces, things like that, get sponsors. So, you know, sometimes people, they'll get like a DM from my account that says like, hey, it's George with the Weekly Howl team. Like, yeah, that's, you know, someone from my team, like sending out a DM. So I've got some people now. Um, I do have, you know, people helping me with my other social medias as well. Um, So yeah, certainly at this point, it's expanded out. But that's just because um, I just don't have the time anymore, right? I've got to be on the spaces. I've got to do other stuff. I'm probably going to hire somebody to like start taking over some of the time of the spaces as well, just to clear up some time there. I'm trying to hire a virtual assistant right now to deal with like a lot of the back end stuff, you know, but it it has to get to a point where it's worth it for you. In the early days, you know, I didn't try to, I didn't even attempt to monetize Twitter until I had 50,000 followers. Um, never tried to make a penny off of it until that point. And even then I wasn't even trying, it just started coming to you, right? Cause you have a certain amount of followers. So the early days, like it's very hard to say you're gonna go and hire a team. Like I have payroll now, you know, you can't have payroll when you have like a hundred followers. So unless you're in like that type of position and you had like, you know, a million dollar exit from your last company and kudos to you and that's what you wanna do. Um, but for the majority of people that I'm speaking to, you're, you're gonna have to figure out on your own in the beginning and then eventually you can scale up. Yeah, for sure. And and I know what that feels like. It's it's crazy when you have a lot of people working for you. Not only is it payroll, it's extra pressure, like a lot more things, a lot of extra things that you kind of need to be dealing with. So so that, that's cool that you're kind of growing. You went from having a full team backing you, bootstrapping it, and then now bringing a team back on. That just shows that it's become extremely successful. Um Let's let's talk a little bit about like 40 hours. I mean, you're on spaces for 40 hours talking to people and, and speakers. How, how does that feel like just to constantly be able to communicate and, and speak with these amazing minds? You know, it's awesome. And the opportunities just keep coming in the last four months. We've had Bill Ackman, Elon Musk, you know, multiple CNBC everyday presenters, uh, politicians, right? Uh, a number of them coming on. So it's really cool opportunity, the access that it gets. And I think with Elon taking over Twitter, more people see them as accessible now too, right? He's got a lot of fans that wanted to hop on and chat. I hope that they continue to invest in the product. Twitter spaces is a fraction of what it could be. I mean, if they put, you know, some resources into fixing the glitches, building out the tab, having accessibility on desktop and iPads, they could really take it to the next level. It's just waiting for them to build it out. Um, So you know, I, unfortunately, most of the Spaces team got fired. All my friends there got fired. Um, I hope that they're, you know, looking to maybe rehire for that at some point. I understand that they had a liquidity crunch that they had to go through. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. But Spaces are just a top, top, top tier opportunity for a couple of reasons. The biggest is 
50 people that you can get access to. But number two, for me with spaces, it's working in public, right? Yep. People, everybody knows like that I'm busy because they can just always come into Twitter and see me working, right? And that has a lot of effects. I have people that want to work with me because they go, I love your work ethic. How do they know my work ethic? Because they always see me on spaces. They always see me online. There's a Very lot of people cool. who have incredible work ethics and I'm sure you're one of them and you run a bunch of businesses, but everything's behind the scenes, right? It's like yep. meetings and stuff. And like, people don't see it in public. People see my work in public, which is really helpful. And then number two, it's a dual bonus of like, I can monetize spaces. I mean, you've been in my sponsored spaces, but at the same time, I'm also getting followers, right? Yep. So it's like kind of like taking from two pots. Yeah, no, I was impressed right off the bat when I started to join these spaces and I started to kind of wrap my head around how you monetize it and how at the same time you're monetizing it, you're giving small startups or even big companies the opportunity to pitch themselves to tons of followers and you yourself are gaining followers at that moment, adding more people to your newsletter. Like, I mean, it's a dream business for people when you think just from that perspective. So that's amazing. And I, and I feel like building in public has become so popular lately. I see tons of people trying to do it, especially in the NFT community just saying, hey, I'm going to build in public. I'm going to let people experience the journey. And I think it makes you a lot more trustworthy. Like you go on those spaces and I know a lot of people are, are regulars because I, when I'm on a speaking panel, I love to kind of scroll through and see who's on and you see a lot of familiar faces. So when you hear yourself or even Evan talking on the spaces, like that's a trustworthy voice that you've heard and clearly have done the homework to bring some of these amazing speakers. I know we've talked a lot about spaces. Maybe the last thing to wrap it up is, is what's the biggest space you ever had? Like what was kind Kind of that space that blew up yeah so there's i guess a couple i could throw out here uh the one that elon musk came on evan was ho hosting i was in there as a speaker i was supposed to be we basically have glitches spaces have this very annoying glitch where if a space has over a thousand listeners in it you like can't get up certain accounts I was supposed to be there coasting on the Wolf account is what it is. That one had about 60,000 people in it. Wow. And yeah, total, I think about a half million maybe came through. That's amazing. And so that one was really, really big. Outside of that, um, I've had spaces that have had, um, I've co-hosted. I co-hosted a space when this whole bank crisis uh, started a few weeks ago that had 16,000 people in there. And so that one was obviously really big. That one was one that Bill Ackman was on as well as others. So that was a big conversation. And then aside from that, I'd say some of my biggest spaces have been other Tesla spaces with just large Tesla investors. Um, probably reaching, you know, two and a half, 3,000 people at any given moment. Um, I also have had spaces where I've brought on, you know, large hedge fund investors that people wanted to hear from. Also probably around two to 3,000 people at any given moment, which is, you know, a very sizable number when people put yeah. it into perspective. Most auditoriums hold, you know, maybe three, five, 600 people, right? And you think about having 3,000 people there, that would be a massive event. Yeah, no, no. And, and it, it really speaks on the power of technology. And I remember, I think maybe the second space I was on really didn't know what I was doing there, didn't feel feel like I was at the same level of a lot of the people on there. And I clicked and looked and I saw there was like 1300 people. And I was like, wow, I need to do a little research before I open my mouth here, because I wasn't expecting that type of crowd. And and you put it really in a perspective there with uh, most auditoriums don't hold even close to that. So if you think it's just a virtual auditorium, yeah, you can't see the people, but they're listening. So, so that's amazing. Um, something I always like to do kind of at the end of the episode is, is ask the person I'm speaking to, what are you excited about right now? And that can be anything, a new project coming up, a new trip. It could be as simple as a new pet that you're getting. So to, to kind of wrap things up, I'd love to say, Wolf, what are you excited about right now? Right now, I'm excited to first off, uh, be back home, uh, for <laughs> a week from traveling so I can be back in Eastern time, which is always nice. Adjusting yep. to the West Coast and having to wake up at five in the morning to host spaces is not fun. No. So I am excited to get some sleep. I think that's going to be good for me. I have not gotten sleep in a while, it feels like. I think I've had like <laughs> three full days of sleep this year, uh, wow. something like that. So we'll see what happens. I am excited to get my taxes paid. I think that that is uh, something that needs to get done soon. So I'm excited to get that out of the way. Should be good. Get taxes paid. A law-abiding citizen over here. <laughs> and um, outside of that, you know, I think it's just going to be a great week. We've got, I think, the most spaces that have ever scheduled it a week this week. We've got wow. 28 spaces this week. Uh, so it's going to be a very full week. So those are just some things that I would put off the top of my head that I'm excited for. But I also would say one other thing is I did a really, really, really popular in-person event this past week in Los Angeles. 250 people came. We had open bar for multiple hours. We had art all around there. We had great conversations. And I am going to be planning another one in New York in about two and a half to three weeks. So that is something wow. to keep on the radar. 
Awesome. We we got to get if that one's a huge success, which I'm sure it will be. We got to get you to come down to Miami um, and and do one here. I'd love to. I'd love to attend that. So with that, I also want to make sure we're gonna post down below um, the links to your social medias. But if you want to kind of read out what the Twitter handle or Instagram handle is, just in case, um, I'd love for people to be able to go follow you and kind of watch your journey and learn from you, like I have. Yeah, Twitter is Wolf underscore Financial and Instagram is Wolf. Uh, Wolf Financial underscore official. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Gav. It was an amazing conversation. I know there's tons of amazing nuggets in here that people are going to take back and learn from. So I appreciate you coming on. And, and that's it for episode two here at the Virtual Ventures Podcast.